again from this definition. What else is here? So please do remember, one second for body waves, 20 seconds for Rayleigh waves. Usually, now in the standards, are using the vertical component. Then there are some corrections, because of course, you have to take care that an earthquake at a given depth, deeper it is, for example, less it will excite surface waves. It's not easy. The long period. Please do remember the analogy with the strings. So if you're plucking the string in places where the modes are not, uh, how to say, whose lobes are not important, it's not easy to excite them. So someone should apply corrections for distance and depth. The idea is still the same, to equalize. So it's not easy, and that's why from the 50s until the 70s, there were many tables of these corrections here for different regions of the Earth. Then there are two other correction factors trying to distinguish path effects, for example. Uh, you will see on Monday, I hope, that, for example, an elasticity of the Earth at the surface can be very different. Uh, you have a taste of this here, in one of the pictures that we have been looking at here. And we will go back to this uh, in one of the last slides of the Monday's lecture that will be about unelasticity. So if you take these two isocyasmal maps, you see how narrow they are in California, how broad they could be in the central US. Q is very different there. So in some way, if you want to measure an absolute energy released by an earthquake, you should take care about this. So you should take a correction for the region. And that's why there is a correction there. And if you have a site, for example, the, your instrument is located on the site that is locally amplifying or deamplifying waves, you should take care about this. That's why, in principle, you should put your instrument on bedrock, on solid rock. But if it is not, okay, you should take care and maybe apply correction factors. So it's not easy in practice, but easy in, in theory. This is very simple, you take a seismogram, and you measure it like that. But what is important now is that at teleseismic distances. Yes? CS, uh, yes. so correction for. Uh, I don't know anything else about this. CR. Uh, for site. CR, correction for source region. Source in the sense that if you're, like in Missouri, if your source is located in a very, uh, how to say, low Q region or high Q region, and your receiver is there, you, you should try to correct for that. Okay? So it's, if it is located in a subduction zone or trying to, to equalize. The idea is to equalize. So that this measure is connected to energy. And this will be the topic that we are going to develop now. Okay, the summary of a new definition of magnitude is here. So body waves, and you see that you're looking at the seismograms in totally different places if the signal is coming from a telesize. They're very well separated and totally different. You see how these wiggles here contain relatively high frequency. How these wiggles here are separated, they are later. Remember that on average, Rayleigh waves is 92% of S on average. It's not the general rule, and then we have dispersion. But so you take, you try to take, in the 70s, remember, seismometers, and there was the birth of computer science applied to seismology. So it was easier to compute Fourier transforms and to do processing on the signals. But you see how separated are these. Okay, that could be the end of the story. It's not. Because two, well, one, essentially one factor was affecting these estimates. And it is actually a simple one. Now I will go relatively fast on some slides, but just to show to you that there is an intrinsic limitation 
in the maximum estimate, actually, uh, what I'm trying to say is that these two definitions saturate. So they are going up to a given level, but you have the feeling that the energy of the earthquake is larger than that level, but it's not evident there. And that's saturation. Actually, that problem is connected to the theory of a source spectrum that we have seen a couple of lectures ago. It's a very, very simple concept. And the solution is also a simple one. In practice, you will see. Also, in that case, it's not that easy. Okay, so up to this point, it would be nice if all the possible definitions of magnitude, there are still other ones, like for example, duration of magnitude, they coincide. So they should be giving a number that is telling to you, okay, that's the strength of an earthquake. But they don't coincide in many cases. Well, in one case, it's trivial why they don't coincide, and that, that's nature. Please do remember in the 70s, Nuclear tests were run at that time. And usually a nuclear explosion is connected to an explosion. So you can imagine that an explosion is very rich of body waves, but not of surface waves, relatively. In principle, an isotropic expansion is not generating S waves, for example. In practice, it is. But so the distinction between a B and a MS for some events was important to detect nuclear explosions. So MB larger than MS for some events was in the nature, in the bad nature of those tests. But for tectonic earthquakes, they should give the same number. But in many cases, they don't, especially for large earthquakes. These are two events relatively recent. And you see that actually MB is trying to push the, the, the number, but it's not. While MS is larger, much larger, about one unit. Please do remember it's a logarithmic value. So something is strange there. Well, the answer is connected to saturation. In practice, these numbers were not growing up to 6.6 .6 for MB, and they put 8 point something for MS. And so there was a sort of a puzzle in the 70s. And there was a seminal paper by Karamori and Anderson. And they were dealing with the large earthquakes uh, that had been collected until that time, the largest ones. And the numbers of the mass were 8, 8.1, 8.2, but nothing more. But they had the feeling that the earthquake sh should be larger in some way, especially those coming from the subduction zones. So the problem about this definition, the standard definition of, uh, here I put many words, but you will see it's very, very easy, is that there is something physical behind that definition. But that definition is not able to reveal. For example, uh, like this, which don't see, please. Uh, we see an example. I hope you do see, yes, the gray zones. So, for example, if you give a look to these two waypoints, immediately you see by eye that they are totally different. But if you stand on the definition of MB, those numbers are pretty much the same. But of course, MS is not. They are totally different. So the amplitude of body waves is not able to get larger than something. But something was about 6, 6.3, 6.6. You can't get a larger amplitude. While MS, you, you say, oh, wow, it's growing, it's beautiful, but still 8 point something. So there was, is, was there something wrong in the definition of the magnitude? That was the feeling. And you see that there was this flat zone after some numbers. That's saturation. Well, you know the answer. Now we know the answer. It's in the source spectrum. I hope you do remember. Let me refresh your memory because we're going to give a look again to that 
with two new parameters. And if you go to the mechanism, at the end of this lecture, we consider the convolution of two boxcars. It's here. Then for lazy people, and today, luckily, it's Friday, so we can be lazier than usual. I told you, okay, the Fourier transform of the boxcar is the sync function. I downloaded an app just to show it to you. And the sync function can be roughly approximated by seismology, not by mathematicians, but something that is flat and then one over. Now you have, we have two. One is connected to rupture time, and rupture time for large events could be very large. So one over TR can be very low. And the other one is rise time, so we have two. So we have a zone where there is one over omega decay, and then one on the over omega squared. And the most important picture for us that we are going to revisit today is the omega squared source aspect. Very simple, very clean, and now you see there is the logarithm of amplitude there. That is at the base of the definition of magnitude. So you get a feeling here that if you are drawing lines here, so if you are referring to periods that are in this zone here, cannot grow. While immediately you have the feeling that the place where it should grow forever, in principle, is at very low frequencies. Because here, this quantity will be proportional to M0. So if M0 is growing, that part will grow. So we have to stay beyond or behind, depends on your point of view, corner frequency. And corner frequency for large events can be very small, because TR can be very large. That was the thing. And that's why Kanamori and Anderson published a very nice paper which was coming from the theory, from the representation theorem, it was coming from uh, Haskell model, very, very simple theory about the source of radiation. And so they tried to, to use, let me see, okay, ah, that's already the end of the story, okay. But we will see later how to use this definition. So that's the most important slide for today. It's our source spectrum revisited. Actually, it's definitely the same. But now we have two lines. The first line is here at zero. That means one second, one hertz or one second. Now, if you draw a line there, you see that until this point here, the curves are growing, but then they're stopping. So if you continue to increase M0, but there you don't reveal it. That's the stop. That's why MB is saturating around 6.5 or before. You could say, OK, let's take 20 seconds now. So let's go to 1 over 20. So the better we go here, uh oh we have the same problem at larger magnitudes. So that's why traditional MS and MB magnitudes saturate. Is it clear to you? It should be very simple. You cannot go over there. You touch the roof. OK? So what would you do? As you can see here, there is a knee. You, you cannot go over. Ah, look at these pictures. Well, you should say, let's go to longer periods or shorter frequencies. So let's go here. If we draw a line at 100 seconds, 200 seconds, we can go over and we will not touch the roof, right? Yes, that's the idea, to go to longer periods. And this is what Karamori Anderson and then Karamori suggested to go so long that we can go to zero frequency. And that was the idea, that was the start of what we call nowadays moment magnitude. So to use M0 to define a magnitude. 
If we are able to estimate M0, then we are done. Because M0 is read here. Look at this. Oh, please be aware, uh, I'm sorry for that. In seismology, in many cases, still CGS units are used. So, for example, moment, it should be Newton times meters, in many cases, is still dying a centimeter. Uh, there is a factor seven, and it's very easy to, to be computed. If you, if you, you, you can do this exercise from CGS, so centimeters, grams, grams is not that important, but seconds to international system. You will see that there is a difference right here. So when you read here, 32, 26, 32 for larger magnitudes, please, it's not Newton times meters, otherwise the Earth would explode, okay? So sorry about that. But you see that here, in the source spectrum case, there is log M0. So if we measure M0, hmm, we're done. That's the idea. And this is what Kanamori did in practice. But if, before, the new definition of, of moment uh, magnitude that nowadays is MW, you should ask, why W? Uh, the new name you will see. OK, let me spoil it. After pain, it's here. OK, that's the killer, OK? The murderer is this one. MW. Now, why W? L stands for local. S stands for surface. B stands for body. W, well, Kanamori said, I was using the first letter that was available at that time. But if you want to remember it, you can remember work, because it's connected with moment in some way. But it's MW. So that's the definition that we want to conquer now. And what I want to do with you is to give a look again to what Kalamori and Anderson did in 75. And they were launching the idea, the theoretical basis of the idea of MW. So we will start from some concepts about earthquake energy. And the first one that we touched but we have not properly defined in the first lecture of this course, the second one actually, was the concept <coughs> of stress drop. And it was important. It is important. Now, it's, very, it's a very easy definition. It's fair. So we decided that an earthquake, we understood that an earthquake is a stress imbalance somewhere. There are tectonic forces, that's the engine, okay, pushing, maybe the fault is already there. We push, there is friction, okay? Stress is increasing, then it's overcoming the limit of rock, sliding, okay? After the sliding, there is a relaxation. Okay, so let's consider the stress before the increase. That's the maximum, that's the falling of a stress. It's the new equilibrium stress. If you want, you can call it pre-seismic, Seismic, co-seismic, relaxed. But it's very easy. It's but bouncing before and after. There is a stress drop. That's the definition. Of course, you have to imagine this over a fault. But if you squeeze all your information in one point, OK, that's the stress drop for the area. Delta sigma. OK. So this is the missing definition that we need. Now, I'm asking to all of you, actually, because I'm sure that how stress is related to strain, usually? Actually, what is strain? Uh, you can say whatever, because I signed 10 minutes ago the, the grades to Patrizia, so weight physics is there. What is strain? In very simple terms. Volume, volume, deformation. Deformation. Okay. Wait. The change in volume is a specific stress. But in general, it is 
a measure of change. So that's the initial length. I'm not that strong, but if I try to stretch it, I measure the new length. It's a delta L of L. Please do remember, it's a pure number. An extension in the three dimension may be involved, but still it's a pure number. OK, so since we define a stress drop, can we define a strain drop? Well, it's before, it's after. So, what is the unbalance in terms of strain is the slip, the average slip over something, over a characteristic dimension. So, there is a definition that is not that physical like the stress drop that is dynamic, but strain drop can be defined as the slip over a fault over a characteristic dimension of the fault. Okay, the fault could be width and length, Let's take a characteristic dimension. We will see later in a slide that I put there in a messy position, but it's important to, to give to us an idea about the dimensions of the fold, how much it is. Could be 100 kilometers for magnitude 8, could be 700, 1000 for magnitude 9, could be 10 kilometers for magnitude 7 or less, and so on. So it's that dimension. And slip could be, <clears throat> let's see, well, 10 meters over that characteristic level. So that's a strain drop. Now, if I have stress, if I have strain, they should be related by some elastic parameters. For pure tectonic event, let's put mu. And then let's put a constant that is taking into account the geometry of the rock. For example, you can find in tables, you, probably you will do something about this with curve. But for example, you can consider a circular fault or a rectangular fault. This is a sort of a shape factor. Okay? Good. Uh, in this slide, there are just simple things, just very simple ideas. Um, and just to show to you how Kanamori and Anderson were using these concepts around 75. Okay, then they said, now let's take the large earthquakes that we recorded. Please do remember there was the burst of seismology after the 50s with seismometers, WWSSN, computers, so it was really a, a new era for instrumental seismology. Okay, but they were standing on geometry there. So they said, Let's imagine that there are some scaling relationships for earthquakes. It's a very rough approximation, actually. It's not, it's not that easy. But otherwise, the camp cannot record the terrible plot that I'm going to make now. So let's take one event. That's a rectangular fault. C is decided. OK, good. What about a larger one? Well, let's increase using a scale factor. There is a sort of an aspect ratio. OK? And so they said, let's imagine that the width and the length are scaled. And let's call this constant aspect ratio. Please do remember that there is a limit here. Because if you're not in a subduction, subduction zone, this could be the brittle ductile transition. So, end of the earthquakes here. They're going to flow there, not to break. Okay? In subduction zones, in principle, you can think about this. But just to have a simple idea. What's the next? Well, let's imagine that if the dimension of the fault is increasing, also the slip is increasing. I'm exaggerating it here. OK, so constant strain. Now, if you use this ratios, these scaling similarities, now we can write M0 in different ways. The basic definition, you know it, is the average slip times the area times mu. That's the definition, representation 
theorem. Now you know what is it, the definition, the meaning. It's the moment one of the double, oh, the two couples that are representing an earthquake, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so that's the basic writing. If you use this three, you can, you, you, you can rewrite M0 in different fashions here. For example, with the um, cube power of the characteristic length, or with 1 over um, 1.5 respect to the area. I was changing it a bit the slide. Uh, in the old printing, there should be A here, I guess. And since here I was using S, because Kalamori and Anderson were using S, I put S here. So uh, I adjusted this. Just to tell to you that M0 and some physical parameters of the fold can be scaled with powers. And if they are scaled with powers, if you take the logarithm, there will be bounds. That's right. Okay, the third similarity relation was a little bit more tricky. They called it dynamic, actually it's kinematic. But we can understand it because they are saying that the rupture time and the rise time are scaling together. Because L tilde, hmm, there is another error here. Um, okay, let me confess, I'm guilty. Because this should be L tilde. Because it's not L medium. It should be the characteristic dimension of the fault. So it could be length, could be width, or could be the average. So that's the correct right. What is this? Well, that's rapture time. What is tau? Rise time. So Bell ratio is constant. It's a rough approximation. But just to put things together and to see the earthquakes can go together. So it was a, an attempt to use very basic um, theoretical considerations, try to look for similarities of earthquakes. OK, uh, this is the same concept, a little bit expanded, using formulas coming from your textbook. It's a relaxing uh, feature for you, I hope. Uh, a different way to rewrite. This is an assumption that the source is, the fault is circular, so now instead of scaling like that, you can imagine it's scaling with radius. It's just to put some numbers there because some constants can be defined. And what is nice here is that following standard West session, we can have an estimate here of TR, but of course it's the dimension divided rupture velocity. You do remember that the rupture velocity is a percentage on average of the S. So that's the definition. Rise time, that's a way to approximate it. And V16, 7 and pi, they are coming from the fact that the fault is supposed to be a circle. circle. Okay? Just to put some numbers and to have an idea. And so if you assume an average Vs of 4 kilometers, that's what's happening here. Just to have a, uh, a feeling of the numbers. The feeling of the numbers is telling us that rupture time is much longer than rise time. But they can be expressed in terms of their ratio. If you assume some specific scaling <coughs> ratios. Okay, good. What's next? What they did, Kenamori and Anderson, okay, they had been using the concept of M0, representation theorem, they had been using the theory of the source spectrum, Haskell model that we discussed, and they had been using the catalog of strong events that they accumulated until the 70s. There, there were relatively many at that time. And this is one of the original plot. And these lines here consider constant stress drop. So also delta sigma is supposed to be constant. So that's constant, that's constant. If that is the case, when you're going to plot, please do, do imagine that, for example, when you plot log of m0, it's not so certain how to measure mu, a, u. So nowadays it's not. At that time, it was much, much more difficult. But 
just to have an idea. They were putting points there. Okay, now if you plot this, they were using A. I should change all the slides here. That's not the logarithm of the amplitude, that's the logarithm of the area. So I should. Sorry for that, I will try to, to clean this, this part here. But you see, these lines here are related to different values of stress drop. Constant. These are logic of the points with constant stress drop. And you see that the points, the black and white dots, and the black and white they were using, interplate, what does it mean? And interplate. Interplate, they are occurring on the plate boundaries. These are the ones that you are considering normal ones. Interplate means that there is not an evident plate suture there, but they can occur. There are many, especially in the Indian Plateau, for example. The Butch earthquake is one of these. The Missouri event that we have seen in the central US, there is no plate there. But earthquakes can be due to some flexural loading, and the part is breaking inside. But the most common ones that they could uh, analyze are the black ones. And you see that the other ones are a little bit different. But let's follow the black ones. They are standing in a linear feature with values of stress drop between 10 and 100 bar. Please do remember that stress and also stress drop is a measure as the units of pressure. Now, what is the typical unit of pressure? OK, how it's called? Pascal. Pascal. It's so tiny. Okay, it's too small. It's nice for some experiments, but for the Earth, it's too small. For example, now we are on average with the pressure of one atmosphere. That is 10 to the fifth power. So give a look to that the Earth above. Okay? So it's a, quite a, an important pressure. Okay? So it's not in Pascal. That's why usually the units that are used here are hundreds of powers. Okay. So they said, hmm, there is some, something that is nice with powers there. The last step that they did was to go back again. Now I try to put some animations here, otherwise you will be scared by what is coming there. And they said, hmm, OK, let's make a further step. Let's take the source spectrum of some simple extended source model, Pascal model, and let's give a look also to rise time and rupture time. So now we do remember that the source spectra is made is the convolution of two boss cars, uh, blah, 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 blah. And so they reused again what we have seen. And now we are stopping here. OK, let's stop. Now, this formula here is exactly the formula that we use for the source spectra. Let's make a recap about the sink function. That's why I this, now I decide to make a sort of uh, one minute parenthesis about some recap about its properties. That's why I was downloading this. It's nice because it's showing different features. Now you have to know that if you look on, for example, Wikipedia, that has a beautiful page on the sink function, they are referring to unitary or normalized sin function. Does it mean that whatever you take there, for example, if duration is t, and this is what is traditionally used in seismology, usually the box car has a duration 1, so minus 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and its units is 1 so that the area is unitary. But of course, you can imagine that this has a duration t. And for, in our case, we have two, rise time and rupture time. OK? OK, so the normalized function, usually, is containing, if it is just x, sin of x is sine of x over x. That's not to normalize. It's going to be 0 at pi and pi, blah, blah, blah. If you want to normalize, you have to put it here at pi. 
Now it's zero at one, two, three, and so on. What's next? If the duration is not one, okay, you have to put the duration here. If the amplitude is not one, you have to put something there. Just to tell you that in practice, and this is nice, you can change the amplitude from one, let's see if it is working, and you see that the amplitude is still changing. Okay? If the duration is one, uh, well, if here it is too small, you cannot see it. Look at the duration now. The longer the duration is, T is increasing, but now the argument, the zeros, are decreasing, as you can imagine. So let's increase T. Now the numbers, the zeros are getting smaller and smaller. And you can guess that because you can imagine to have on the top a delta, then it should be flat in the other domain. If you're going to, to be like that, continuous, it will be a delta. So as you know, as you can guess, the two domains are totally complementary. So after this nice excursion on the sink, let me go here. What do we have here? Well, we have omega. The pi is embedded in omega. And omega is 2 pi f. That's why 2 has to be here. And why there is tau? Well, because one has duration rise time, the other one has duration rupture time. And now we write rupture time as L over Br. That we assume cos. So until this point, nothing is new. It's the multiplication of two sync functions with different duration, so with different zeros, because that is 2 over tr, 2 over tau. OK? And the last approximation, let's see if I still have, yes, approximation that we are going to use is this terrible one that we have already used. So let's say for a unitary one, that the sin function is flat until the argument and one over from the argument of. It's a brute approximation, but it's easy. So if we have two at the time, we know that one times one will give them zero until the first fall down. And the first fall down will be two over tr. 1 over omega until the second. And the second will be 2 over tau. And then omega squared from that one. That was the vision that we had two lectures ago. OK? You accepted that. OK. Nowadays it's the same, but just writing the variables in a different way. Now, instead of omega, let's use omega as 2 pi over t. That is tau. It's a period. And now, let's wait, because we have some periods important. So, they should be large or small, respect to what? Hmm, to this t. And t could be one second, for example body waves, or it could be 20 seconds, surface waves. So let's try to give a look to this expression here, having in mind what magnitude could be. Because magnitude could be, will be, the logarithm of this, right? At some periods, for example, when omega is 2 pi over 20. So. This one is nothing else than the other plot that we have used, but writing the arguments in a little bit different way. So we have two regimes. For example, when omega is smaller than, what does it mean, when the period will be larger than, compared to what? 
two, two periods that we have in mind, rise time and rupture time. Okay? So it will be flat, one over, one over, and then square here. But now, all the comparisons between frequencies, 2 over TR, 2 over tau, now we are made in time, having in mind a period. So, when the rise time, or if you want, the reference period is much larger than rise time times time is pi, okay, we're in the flat region. When this is rupture time, when the period is larger than blah, blah, blah. And they were writing here, not M0, but some geometrical factors. Now, if you remember what we have been writing before, like M0 could be written in terms of length or area, well, you will have different regimes and different powers respect to the geometrical characteristics of the fold. Um, I know I've been very messy, but what I just want to tell you is that they were using the same information that we had, the same. This is, was in our pocket, okay? But writing it in a little bit different way, maybe writing M0 in, in, related to some of its terms, in this example here it's related to length, and writing the arguments, having in mind rise time, rupture time, and a period. It would be 20 seconds. Okay, the last step. If now we do remember the best magnitude that we had been using until 75, so we were trying to understand, okay, what is, in, in theoretically, the logarithm of the amplitude of 20 seconds? Okay, it should be like that. MS should be something related to the logarithm of A. 20. So let's give a look to this here, having in mind now <coughs> with t period of 20. These are the same writings of these ones, but with different parameters. Okay? We were trying to, to look for a for a low. So when the rise time is much less than 20 seconds, and that is the case, and rupture time uh, sorry, is much less than 20 seconds. Oh, that's not the case for large events. 20 seconds is small. Please do you remember Toku, for example, two or three minutes. Mm. Okay? But all these cases here are giving different slopes. Okay? Now, what is the maybe most important case for large events? It's this one. Because in this, I, hope, I, I did it yesterday, so I hope it's the correct one. Why? Well, because the rise time is much less than 20 something, uh, divide 20 by, by 3 or something like that, and the rupture time will be much larger than 20 over 3, let's say, 7. So this should be the case in which most of the large earthquakes should fall. Okay? So what they did next? Well, they make a plot. And it's this plot. Still coming from Kanamori Enders. What do we have here? Well, here you have to imagine that we have rupture time. Here you have to imagine that we have, uh, sorry, rise time. And this is rupture time. You see, L over V. And they were plotting as black dots the events that they had been collecting, collected in the recent years. And they pretty much accept this one. Oh, you have to imagine that there are large errors here. We're in the 70s. So you see the error bars here could be very large. But most of them, as they were forecasting, they were falling there. Shorter rise times, long rupture times. But then they realize, okay, wait a second. So we have a solution for saturation. Because as we were waiting for, large events should stay there. 
according also to this over spectral theory. And you see in the original plot here, this was the case when they were using a mess. It's, that was the magnitude that they had been using. And then they plotted, okay, well, in this case, the relation between the logarithm of the moment and the magnitude should be 3 over 2. It's coming from the previous. You see? Okay? Okay. So the next idea that Kanemori used was, okay, come on. Let's measure moment and let's define the magnitude using this relation here. So it will be 2 over 3. And this is what they did. What he did, actually, they were a team. So that's why all this story here, all these slides here, just to tell you why it's 1.5. It's 3 over 2. Why it's there? Okay, it's coming from a source spectrum. So if we get M0, staying at very long periods, maybe infinite periods, we get a number, we take the logarithm, we multiply by 2 over 3, and then we have to do something. Then we have a magnitude that is not going to saturate. And this is what they did. So the next step was to put together all these ideas here, plus an additional experimental, if you want empirical, that's better, the studies of Gutenberg and Richter, yeah, still the same couple of guys, that in their book, it's very important, it's the 1956, very simple book, they tried to estimate what was the relation at that time of the logarithm of M0, please do remember, M0 was already there, but uh, Kanamori and Anderson used it, and the empirical relation with the magnitudes that they had. And the best one was a mess. There was also empirically a 1.5 factor. And actually, this is the relation, because uh, in, the in the 56, you cannot use M0. Representation theorem was not there yet. But, but Gutenberg and Richter, they were estimating energy. So if you add this plus this, 1.5 is still there. So theory, practice, everything was giving 1.5. And there is also another additional simple feature that I added here. That the, and this is the feature that used um, Gutenberg and Richter. They said, OK, let's take a very simple wave, an harmonic wave, like this one, okay, in a given position. If you take the velocity, you know, since wave physics, that every time that you take a derivative of an harmonic, you take down omega. Omega is amplitude over t in some way, but it's t. Omega is to pi over t. OK. So if you consider roughly the energy related to the kinetic energy, it will depend on the square of that. So OK, it's something related to the square of the amplitude, as we know, in 1 over the square of the period. OK? So if you take the logarithm of the energy, it should depend on A over T. And A over T is a magnitude. So that's why Gutenberg and Richter, they were convinced that in the magnitude there was energy with this sim very simple argument. OK? That's why they were looking for something like that, for an empirical. Then Kanamori and Anderson did their study, and the final solution to define moment magnitude was this one. So the idea here is no more measuring A and the T, let's measure M0. We take that number, we take the logarithm, we multiply by 2 over 3, and then we have to do something. What was their idea? It was simple. The slope is given by theory, 2 over 3. But then, let's imagine that was the new magnitude. This was a mass. Until 8, they should be the same. There is no saturation. OK, let's choose that number in order that M, now W, and MS are the same at magnitude 8. 
If you do that on a global scale, you get this number. Please take care, this is in newton meters. If you're reading the same expression in diameter centimeter, it is 10.73. That's the end of the story. So the piece of theory that we have been developing for the source spectrum, plus the very simple uh, consideration of Gutenberg Richter, decided that Kanamori officially, but a team of people, was using this as the definition of the new magnitude. And this is the resulting principle. No more saturation. Now you take it to zero and you're done. There is a but. And the but will be related to the only homework that I'm going to give to you for this course. But it will be a beautiful homework, I hope. Uh, by the way, it is a very tiny paper. Don't, I will say to you in, in a couple of minutes. This is a sort of a summary. Because now you see that uh, some of the most important events collected in the past, that's the largest event that has been recorded in human history. Well, the estimates at the time, but when you see such beautiful numbers in magnitude, please do remember that there are uncertainties. Okay? So you can read beautiful number there, but for the Alaska 1964, you can have 6.2, but please do remember all the messy thing to measure and be. So in practice, still you have a plus minus 0 0.2 there on average. And, that, and you will see also in the modern ones. I, will, I hope to tell you why. Okay, look at the mass. Now you see this is always larger than this one, saturation. But actually, no one was given a number larger than 8.4. But if you take now the, the, the estimate of an area, the average of a slip, that's huge, and you compute the moment, now you see that MW, in this case, is here, is much larger. Actually, uh, this table here is not containing the Sumatra one and the Tohu one, 9.2 and 9.0, respectively. But now you have a flavor on how magnitude can be larger. What is the largest one? Well, up to now, the largest recorded one is 9.5. That's an estimate, 1960 errors there. Okay? That was the Chilean earthquake that was important because it's the largest magnitude estimated. And it's important for the final lectures of the course that will be about tsunamis because actually in 1960 a tsunami occurred that killed one of the people in Japan, from Chile to Japan. So that was the first warning for tsunami physics burst in seismology. Okay, so now you could say we're done. We can measure M0 and we get a magnitude that will never separate. Uh, separate. Spoiler for homework. Well, your homework is just to read the paper. And I think I put it on the, already on the, on the portal. But if you give a look to, if you, no, not here. If you Google, not this one. It's not this one. Don't worry. That's for me. Um, local Y session. Oh, Stein. Seth Stein. One of the author, uh, authors of your textbook. Sumatra. Uh, there are many here. What is this? On meals. I'm looking for a nice picture, don't worry. There is the nature, but there is another one. Is easier. Well, can you, we can give a look to this. Now, you have to know. Actually, I will provide to you a better one than this one, but it will be a couple of pages paper. You have to know that one of the, and this occurred also in Tohoku. But the first estimates for the Sumatra event was magnitude 8.8. .8. 
Actually, it was 8.2 pillars. I still have the warning that was issued, the tsunami warning that was issued on 26 uh, December of 2004, and the warning was there by the agencies, but it was not a terrible warning because the magnitude that was estimated was 8 point something. A few months later, Stein, Seth Stein, and the Miloka, who visited the SCP many times, both of them, published the paper saying, no, no, wait a second, the magnitude was not 8.8, 8, it was 9.2. And the answer is actually in this picture here. Because actually, you have to see that the routine estimation of M0 is not made with rulers. You go there, you measure the fault, you measure the slip, you have a mu, you have M0. But it's made using waves. On routine basis, the waves that are used are not, not anymore at 20 seconds, but the longest that we can record in a few minutes after an earthquake, which was surface waves at long periods. Let's say 100 seconds, maybe 200 seconds. You know, in one hour and a half, they can go on the other side of the Earth, right? You know, do you remember the three modes lecture? One hour and a half, R1. R2, and so on. OK. For very large events, so large that they are called mega earthquakes, actually, 100 seconds is not enough. Still now you're getting the roof. You have to go to longer periods. And to go to longer periods, you have no time. Just a few minutes after an earthquake because you have to wait for something that has longer period than surface waves. What is that? The three modes of the Earth. And this is what they used. So that's your homework, to understand these two pictures using the last lecture of the Wave Physics course. Because during the exam, I will ask you this. Also this, OK? But it's simple. Now, there are other possibilities to use long period signals. And one possibility we will explore with tsunami physics, because tsunami waves have very long periods. But it's a problem, because you try to forecast them, and you don't have to wait for them. That's a problem. Once the tsunami occur, OK, you know. You have some long period information, but it's too late. Also, for the three modes of the Earth, to get them and to analyze them, you have to wait. Progressive into standing. There is a third possibility to have a very long period of information is about, yeah, you do remember the green sponge. In the near field, you have a static displacement. That static is infinite period. It's not getting back anymore. So you can use a GPS around the phone to have an immediate, immediate yeah, estimate of the size. But you have to have GPS pair. So you see, it's not easy. And everything is related yet to this picture. That's why I was telling to you that it's the most important. Actually, today's lecture is here. So you can go. Here, maybe 100 seconds, you can process on a routine basis surface waves. But if you go up, okay, you get magnitude 8, but 9 is not enough. You have to go longer, and that's the problem. Okay? So that's the main message. Please do remember that the, for example, transferoidal modes have a period of about 40, 56 minutes, if you remember. So you're going here, OK? That's the most important message. Everything is related to this nature of a radiation of energy from a seismic source. If you, if you want, the seismic source is a sort of a low-pass filter, a relative low-pass filter. What I'm saying is not that uh, a magnitude 9 is radiating less high frequency than <coughs> this one. But in proportion, 
most of the radiation is at long periods, okay? Because you have this behavior of the source spectrum. That's the most important thing that you have to remember. Okay, so convolution of the rise time, the rupture time, and rupture time, please do remember that is decided by the source, but it is felt by a receiver. And the receiver could be forward, and TR will be smaller, and the corner frequency will be larger, or in the back, and you see the rupture going far from you, so that the apparent rupture time will be longer, and the frequency will be smaller. So please do remember this, directly. Okay, that was the story of MW. And what I want to do with you in this fight, yes? Uh, still, I, I couldn't uh, understand the, the full difference between rise time and rupture time. Let me get, uh, no, that's not here. Let me open another one. Let's go back to the summary of the course, if you want. OK. I told you at the time, this is a terrible picture, but it's nice. Now, what's occurring there? From a dynamic point of view, we have stress unbalances somewhere, tectonics. But we forget about dynamics and we stand on kinematics. In some place, rupture will start. Okay. Here, that part of the fault that is actually the interface between two blocks is going to slip. So that, in this point, the initial one, seismic radiation will start. Why? Because they have a slip. That's rise time. So in the first point there, I have slip over time and zero, 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 equilibrium, slip, equilibrium. This is rise time. It's the time necessary for a point on the fault to slip. That's it. That's not the end of the story, because the rupture is going to propagate in other places. Now, P waves are radiated, S waves are radiated, and they will reach somewhere. Not necessarily this arrow is the largest one. It can be also the smaller. So you have the rupture that is starting here. You have an arrow. Now you have a slip. OK, what is it here? And the rupture is propagating. Sooner or later, kinematics with rupture time will make an arrow here, maybe. Now, the time necessary for the rupture to arrive here is the distance over rupture velocity. That's the partial rupture time. Here, the point will slip, maybe with a time like this one. That's rise time. Still, there is a rupture. Then the rupture maybe will stop here. This will be the final arrow. This point will slip. So the rupture time is on average. Please do remember Haskell's model. It was the simplest. Rupture time will be L over VR. And L is the length of the fault. But each point here is slipping with the rise time. The rise time, in principle, because it is nice from a dynamic point of view, does not know about the other point. That's sleep. End of a story for this point. Now that's relaxed. But rupture is continuing. And other points will sleep. Are you getting the point? I cannot explain in a, in a better way. So, if you want, this piece, according to the magnitude, and I'm going to show to you an important slide, will slide, for example, from magnitude 8, will slide about one meter. Okay? One meter may be in one second. But rupture is continuing. Rupture can be very long. Do you remember the animation? I don't want to open also that lecture of the rupture of a toe. It was starting, 
propagating three minutes. But at that point, in some part of the fault, Ryzen already occurred, sleep. Of course, if you think just in terms of the point source, you don't have rupture time, but it's there. For the point source, look, when I do this with my silly hands, now rupture time is zero, because all the points slide at the same time, right? It's like if rupture velocity is infinite. Mm, it's not possible, but I cannot play with my hands. Okay? So if I do this, I have a rise time, let's say 0.1 seconds. I can do in a very long way. Okay? One second. It's pretty much creep, but and no rupture time. But if I make this first slip, second slip, third slip, I, do, I will have a rupture time. So the rupture is the end of this story here. The slip and the rise time is the story at a specific point. Hmm? So rupture time is the summation of consecutive rise times? No. Slips. No. Why? Because every, everywhere, when we propagate... Rise time is decided by stick and slip friction in a point. Dynamically, is not... Maybe it's related to Vs, but it could be... It's friction. Take two cones. I don't use cones, as you can imagine. Take two. And now you begin to tilt this. Maybe two teeth of the cones will slip, okay? That's the rise time. But now you're continuing, other will, will break, okay, will, will slip. Now, the slip on a point of the surface does not depend, in principle, from what's occurring later. It's not later, because there is the healing theory of Tom Heaton, but that's too complete. Rise time is rise time. Why should I mix with rupture time? But again, sorry, we cannot lose too much time. That's rise time. Rupture time is infinite, uh, zero, because rupture velocity is infinite. So if I take two tables here, let's imagine we put two, okay? And they slip all together, there is no rupture time. All they are slipping at the same time. All the points may be at the same curve. Rise time will be 0 0.1 seconds, and rupture time will be zero, because it takes, well, if you want, in that case, the rupture time could be comparable to the rise time, but actually, rupture time is zero, because all of them are moving at the same time. Rupture time is connected to the velocity of a stress information on a fault. If you have just one point, there is no rupture time, but you have rise time, right? So why they should be the same? Rupture time is connected with the dimension of the fault, to the dimension of the area of the rupture. Okay? You can have a fault adjust have a rupture on a section of the fault. But rise time is the property of one point slipping over the other. If I do this, I have one rise time and no rupture time. Okay? Here, I don't have a rupture time. If you have a point, how can you define a rupture time? It's the time necessary for the rupture to prevail on the fault. But I don't have a fault, I have a point. So there is no rupture time. Okay? Yes. You have only rise time. That's why when you invert for a point source, focal mechanism, the time information that you have there, that is called the source time function, actually is related to the slip on the fault, but not to the rupture, because you're squeezing everything in a point. Are you getting? Yeah. Okay. Now, just also to have an idea about those dimensions, we can see, okay, that's impressive. Please do remember, now we will run in these final slides containing general concepts. Okay, this is a vision at a glance, a very simple one, made by, by Seth Stein, about how a fault, in a very simplified model with a rectangular fault, 
how different they appear for different magnitudes. Remember, it's a logarithmic scale. So you see how tiny is a 6.7 compared to this. Actually, they are putting 9.3. Your homework will be connected to this estimate. Okay? And you see how different they are. Because now, remember, M0 is scaling linearly with area, but magnitude has a logarithm there. And since you have 1.5, you will see in a couple of slides that every step, it's not a step, because actually magnitude is a continuous definition of it. It's not like intensity with discrete degrees, can be whatever number, principle. But when you move from of one unit on this continuous chair, you got almost 32 times of energy. So it's logarithmic with 1.5 there. What's next? This is important just to have an idea about dimensions, about the numbers. This is a collection of data that actually it has been done by Wells and Coppersmith a long time ago, relatively long time ago. Now we have relationships similar to these ones uh, for regionalized in some way, but this was made essentially for California earthquakes, but some worldwide information. But it's important, empirical, giving us an estimate of the dimensions. So for example, let's start here. Let's take a magnitude 8. You go here, you go down, and you get for a magnitude 8, we're about hundreds of kilometers. If you go to magnitude 9, you go here, you get 1,000 of kilometers. If you go to magnitude 7, okay, a little bit less than 100. 6, it's about 10 as an average length. Now you go here and you take length of, for example, here, magnitude 9, you will get a slip of 10 meters. Here, you will get, for example, 100, 1 meter, and so on. Of course, the scatter is huge, but it's giving us a rough idea about dimensions. So magnitude 9 will take, on average, a slip of 10 meters. Now, physically, you have to imagine that the two blocks will have to run 10 meters in some time. That's price time. That time is rise time, okay? Rupture time for a magnitude 9 could be 3 minutes. The two blocks will not stay 3 minutes to make this, to make 10 meters. I will stay 3 minutes, I'm slow. So actually it's creeping if it is doing like that. You need something that is relatively sudden, okay? That's friction. Okay, so Please do remember these orders of magnitude of the dimensions. And the final slides are about two general concepts that you're going to use in some way, um, sooner or later. The first one is an energetic balance. So we have been started with, with dynamics a long time ago, with just a glance of dynamics. And these are very simple uh, calculations made on, on back of the paper by, by uh, standing with sessions, so they are coming, the picture is coming from your textbook, trying to remember the concept of energy. And I like this picture because it's letting us to remember that everything started with a stress unbalance. So we have a stress, initial one, we increase it, rocks are falling, uh, well, not falling, pardon, a sliding, ksh, relax. So stress, was an initial and the final. And this is stress drop. Okay? It's entering into the balance of energy. Now, that amount of stress, that is a force over an area, so force times one dimension is going to give work and energy, has been spent. It has been accumulated thanks to tectonics, but it has now been lost. In what? Well, seismically but also in friction. So we don't, and we don't know, we cannot estimate exactly what is friction. But what we are doing here with very simple computations is a sort of the energy balance. So if you take the strain energy released, 
you will have the average sleep. I, I'm, I'm sorry because they are using get a different uh, value. And now we have used at least four. For example, Aki and Richards have been using this as an average sleep of a fault. It's still the average of uh, terrible errors that I was taking here. Make an average, you will get an average error. Okay, that's the average sleep. Then before, we have been using, well, maybe we have been lucky, D something. So that D bar is the average sleep. S is the area, so that's why I was using S. But okay, I hope you do understand. Then what about the stress drop? Well, you, you can find this, sorry. This number here, that's the average stress during faulting. That's the average. And you can see it here. Okay. Now the stress drop will be the initial minus the final, and sigma bar will be the average, of course. This is a way to put this number here in the balance, that's the total, minus the friction. And we can estimate the energy loss in friction in terms of the friction stress. Please do remember the Coulomb's law of friction. It was kind of from Leonardo, but it was easy, it was related to the normal stress, the coefficient of internal friction. Okay, so you can rewrite the total energy, the energy released in terms of seismic energy, seismic waves, like this minus this. If you write it in different way, that will be the balance. This is a sort of a minimum, and you see it here. Okay? Now, if sigma 1, so the final one, is equal to the frictional stress, stress, but it could be an assumption. So you have a stick, I'm increasing, I'm increasing, that's the friction that is winning, I lose sleep. You can assume that the final stress at the end was is equal to sigma f. It's an assumption. If that it is, this is going to zero. And then E0 will be the radiated energy. That's the minimum one that will, is going to be radiated. Otherwise, it could be more. Everything depends by dynamics. And you're going to explore this with her. Message from this slide here is that please do remember that the energy radiated in terms of seismic energy is a fraction of the whole energy. Usually, the ratio of radiation over the total one is called efficiency, seismic efficiency. And in principle, is a tiny, relatively tiny percentage. So do remember this. What's next? Oh, these are the estimates. And why I was putting this slide here coming from the session, just to let you to remember this. That's energy. Okay? Now, if you give a look to this 1.5, you don't understand that when you go, when you move of one unit on the continuous magnitude W scale, in terms of energy, you have a 10 to elevate it to 1.5. It's, it's 3 over 2. So please do remember that every time you have roughly 32 times the amount of energy when you step of one magnitude. That is a continuous scale. Please do remember. And that's why, if you make a plot of energy, usually, and if you want to devote like a sort of an apple pie plot, it's impressive. Because if you now plot, uh, that's not the updated, I have an updated one that I tried to make. Let's see if I put it here. Oh, yes, there is also, let's use this. This is containing also Sumatra and, and Japan. Now, if you give a look to that, that's impressive because one single earthquake, a large one like this one, is taking most of the pie. So please do remember that magnitude is a logarithmic expression related to energy here. For example, if you sum all the earthquakes between 7 and 8 that are impressive for us in terms of hazard, is one of the, that is the last topic of this course, it's smaller than this. Six to seven, wow. Most of the hazardous events in Italy 
are between six and seven minutes. If you sum all of them in the world, it's pretty much nothing compared to this. So just to have an idea of the power of logarithms in terms of energy. There is one final logarithm that is appearing in seismology. And you can spend a course on that, because um, people that is doing some earthquake statistics is using it a lot. I personally am using it for hazard. But the idea is, and that's the final idea for this topic and for this week, is about the number of earthquakes. So we have seen that there is a logarithm there in terms of energy. Now let's imagine to use a plot, this is a, a cosmetic plot, of a number of events in terms of energy. So in terms of moment. Okay, this is a copyrighted picture coming before, after Sumatra, but before Japan. What do you see here? Moment magnitude. I don't like the term one step. Because it seems that there is a scale with discrete step. It's not. Please do remember. Intensity is discrete. Magnitude is not. And there is no upper limit in principle. Nature probably is putting it at 10. You can understand that the largest M0 can be obtained only in subduction zones. It's the only place where you have large areas. Otherwise, you have to take a strange... Uh, shallow, brittle layer, but to, to, to be extended for thousands of kilometers. And geometrically, it's not stable, I guess, I hope. Okay, um, so please do remember, this is not discrete. On this side, what is impressive is the amount of energy. And now you see, you have to put a lot of zeros, because it's so very and you can, you can compare, you can impress people comparing it with, with other natural events and other human and tragic events, like these ones. And you see that the energy released by an earthquake is huge. Okay? But what is strange here is that the number is decreasing in a sort of an exponential way. Uh, that's not a, a type or a cosmetic thing, because actually the last topic of this messy lecture is what is called Gutenberg-Richter law. Still, those two guys are around with the basic phenomena in seismology. Also because they have been so good and so relatively lucky to use the first data sets. California in the 30s, the first instruments, and so on. And what they did, and I think they published it at first and on the 40s, and then there is the usual 1958 book, was to consider, and now that's the tricky part, the word catalog for all of the events that they had at that time. So, geographically, all the word, the time, let's say, 50 years of time. This is another example, and that same one session were collecting, so I hope that's not important. And this is from 68 to 97. That's another issue. What is that? Well, that's the number of earthquakes per year. Plotted versus magnitude. This is still a mess, but now you can imagine that after 8 is a W. But no magnitude larger than 8 in this period here. Well, if you plot the logarithm of a number, it stays on a line. Now, there are two definitions. The real line one should be the incremental. So you take a bin here, for example, 6 plus uh, 0, 2 minus 0, 2, and you take the logarithm of a number. Then you move, then you move, then you move. When you say, when you look at incremental means, it's all the earthquakes with magnitude less than, with all the earthquakes less than. Okay, you sum them. That's why it's incremental or cumulative. Okay, what you see there is that the relation here is like this one. And this is the original relation found by Gutenberg Richter. It's empirical. What is nice is that on average for the word, this V is what? Minus one. You see? 
that's the logarithm, it is minus 1. So look. What is the message here is that larger the magnitude is, less the earthquake occur. There are two important consequences to this final slide here. Uh, well, the first one, and you will see in the last lecture of this course, is that this low, that is called GR low, and please do remember that in principle is valid at the world scale on many years, is used for seismic hazard. Better, it's used for probabilistic hazard assessment. And we will discuss just 10 minutes in the last lecture on this course. What is nice here is that if you rewrite that very simple expression, remember Gutenberg and Ritter, they were looking for simple things. And this is very simple. But still it's logarithmic. And so if you rewrite it, in terms of n, then you get this value here. Then you do remember that, oh, magnitude is related to moment, right? OK, with 2 thirds. And you can write it as a constant with m0. And if b is 1, there you go. Now, that's power law with non-integral exponent. What does it mean? Fractals. OK. That's why, in many cases, there are studies of nonlinear dynamics to be applied to seismicity. Uh, so that's the different version now written in terms of log of m0. You see, ms log of m0. Final word about this, b. Now, you have to know that this gr then has been applied and is applied every day to different scales, to national scales, to system of faults, to single faults. And maybe it's a sort of a violent extension of what was intended to be worldwide. So it's giving a sort of a ratio between large events and small events. And B is no more one when you go to, to a smaller scale. In its so it's giving to us a sort of a frequency of large events compared to small events. While A, in principle, is telling to you the seismicity of a place. Larger is A, larger will be the number of earthquakes. Another uh, practical feature here is that usually this, at a large spatial scale, is starting from 5. You know why? Because for smaller magnitudes, this line tends to be no, not a line, it's going to be flat. Uh, some people think that this is related to the nature of earthquakes, but most of the people think that this is due to the catalog that is incomplete, because we cannot detect all the magnitude 1 events around the world. Okay? We cannot measure that on average. So that's why. A magnitude 5 is the limit, one of the limits nowadays, maybe it's 4, for which if a magnitude 5 occurs somewhere in the world, it is detected. So from magnitude 5, you can assume that the, the catalog is complete. Um, so you have seen that the quantity that appeared everywhere in the slides here is M0. Now you know what is M0. Oh, well, you, you know since 10 days what is M0. You know what is uh, why it appeared in, in seismology. You know what is its physical meaning. Please do remember the couples, its units. How important it is also trying to estimate the energy. It's a work. Moment is, you know, actually, the moment is a moment, but try to understand also that it could represent a work. It's not a work, but it could represent a work. Uh, please do remember the units. Remember that sometimes it's expressed in tiny centimeters. Please do remember how it's so important in the source spectrum. Again, if you want a summary of these 40 slides here, use just this. OK? 
just pad. That's the source pad. Convolution of the two box cars. Flat, one over omega, one over omega squared. So if you take the logarithm, it would be a line, a line. Remember the definition of magnitude, Richter's. Okay, log of A over A0, A over T, and BMS. Saturation, no way out. The only way not to saturate is to go to M0. But in practice, it is difficult to measure M0, especially one hour after the earthquake, let's say two hours. Because you need to go for mega earthquakes to two long periods. Three modes, tsunamis, and static displacement. Okay, so you know why MW is there. The slope of MW is related to the theory. The intercept of the MW is related to, to be connected with the mass. Uh, you have seen how M0 is also appearing in the number of earthquakes. So please do remember GR law. It's very simple. Log of N is A minus B on average 1, and you get magnitude or logarithm of M0. So M0 was appearing everywhere. Now, <coughs> On Monday, we will discuss something totally different. Just a one minute prequel about what we're going to do. It's, don't worry, we will not do the scattering. And I want to show to you the final picture. Ah, we'll clean it later. We are going to study the queue of the Earth. We will be running because we cannot spend too much time. But this is what I want to show to you. These are called in this slide here, attenuation loads. Oh, let me wake up here. Things here, let me 